welcome to Compass Online. My name is Cassie and I am the Compass Online Coordinator here. Hey, if you're joining us for the first time or if you're joining us as a repeat, we'd love to hear from you and just know that you are here. Fill out our connection card online and let us know, is there something that we can pray for you? Is there a question that you have? Would you like to jump on a digital coffee with us and talk some more? We'd love to connect with you and know that you are here. As a young adult, one of the first things that had a really big impact on my faith journey was to take a spiritual gifts test. A spiritual gifts assessment can help you understand how God wired you and created you so that whether it's with your family, in the workplace, or at the church, you can use the gifts and talents that God has given you to build up His kingdom and to make the biggest impact. If you've never taken an assessment or if you just want to take one again and chat with us, we'd love for you to do so. You can go on our website and take the assessment and then just reach out to us and let us know that you'd like to talk through the results. We'd love to help you get connected to a serving opportunity or even just help you unpack what that means for you and how you can show up in your family and in your workplace. Now we're starting a new series called The Chase. Let's start with worship. Your name. 
Friends, I am on a mission from God. Welcome to the Compass Church, everybody, and to our new series called The Chase. Do you recognize this car? Friends, I am at the Volo Auto Museum, and this is a genuine Bluesmobile. Friends, do you remember in the movie, Elwood Blues bought at auction a decommissioned Mount Prospect police car. It was a 1974 Dodge Monaco, and man, did they go on a chase. You talk about classic car chase scenes. Friends, the one in Blues Brothers was epic. Their mission from God was to get $5,000 to the city hall to pay necessary taxes to keep their beloved orphanage from closing. And so the chase was on. Like 60 Chicago police cars were chasing them through a mall, no kidding, through a mall in suburban Harvey. They went over the Calumet River, jumping on a drawbridge. They, they went through uh, Lower Wacker at nearly 100 miles an hour, friends. It was crazy. They smashed into the glass at the Daily Center and drove through the lobby. Eventually, a pile up of cop cars. That was epic. Friends, they burned through 103 cars in that classic chase scene. Why is it that we love chase scenes so much? Turns out that these screenwriters have studied the art of the chase, and they have realized that if they want to win the, the watcher, they can tap into a uh, instinct within us. I believe that God has given us all a fight or flight mechanism, flight mechanism. That means that we were wired by God to have a surge of adrenaline when we're being chased. Think back to the days when uh, well, I suppose in other parts of the world still today, people were around predators that could kill. You know, the old hunter and hunted drama. And friends, we realize today that that thrill, it's, it's in all of us. And so the chase, whether it be a cop chasing a robber or a dog chasing a cat or a boy chasing a girl or a a defensive lineman chasing a quarterback. Friends, our hearts beat with the adrenaline of a chase. And I'm here to tell you that the greatest chase of all, all time, is God chasing people. Turns out we're about to discover that in the Bible, God is committed to pursuing, to going after every human being on the planet. No matter how far from him they may be, God loves sinners. And he is working behind the scenes and working with people like you and me to coordinate an effort to pursue reconciliation and forgiveness with all people. In fact, we're about to discover that God wanted to be reconciled with the evil king Nebuchadnezzar. Friends, it's true. In this series, we're going to learn about God even wanting that wicked, heroically wicked king. When we talk about the pursuit of God for people, I, I, I go back to a poem called The Hound of Heaven. In that poem, God is compared to like a dog that's in hot pursuit of the prey. It's written, that poem that is, it's written by a man by the name of Francis Thompson. Francis lived back in the 1800s in London, and he experienced the pursuit of God. He dove deep into sin, ran away from the Christian upbringing he enjoyed, and he got into drugs. He became homeless, living on the streets of London. And yet Francis recognized, man, God's after me. And the people he met, in the thoughts he had, in the circumstances of his life, he just had an uncanny awareness that the Lord wanted him. Let me just read you a few lines from that great poem, The Hound of Heaven. Francis writes, I fled him through the nights and through the days. I fled him through the years and through the labyrinth of my ways. 
I sped from those strong feet that followed, that followed after me with unhurried chase and untroubled pace. Friends, it's true. The greatest chase in the universe is God going after people. And we're going to learn about it. We're going to learn how to be his agents, his co-servants in this great pursuit of people far from God. Welcome, friends, once again to our new series called The Chase. Friends, let's dive in, shall we? In this series, we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. Four weeks, one chapter per week, starting now in Daniel 1, 1. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Why is this Nebuchadnezzar trying to destroy Jerusalem? Friends, let me tell you a little bit about this guy. Nebuchadnezzar. Do you know that he is the greatest king of the Babylonian Empire? It all started with his dad. Uh, During the days that Nebuchadnezzar was growing up, his dad led a revolt against the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians had this empire where they ruled the ancient Near East for 300 years. But Nebuchadnezzar's dad led the Babylonians to say, enough is enough. And his dad led a a defeat, an end to the Assyrian Empire. And so his son, Nebuchadnezzar, finds himself the king of Babylon. But his objective was to expand his influence quickly. He did a couple things. Number one, Nebuchadnezzar said, I need to rebuild this once great city of Babylon that has been destroyed by the Assyrians. And so he rebuilt it. In fact, uh, he built the Ishtar gates, the main gates into the city that are gorgeous. We know that because we've seen them. Believe it or not, they were excavated by German archaeologists back in the early 1900s. Brick by brick, they brought it to Berlin and reassembled the Ishtar Gates in the museum there. I have had the privilege of being in Berlin and walking among the beautiful Ishtar Gates. I've seen what Nebuchadnezzar had built. How fun is that? It's like a time machine going back to those great days. In addition to the Ishtar Gates, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is known for building the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Apparently, he had a wife who was from a terrain that had luscious vegetation, and in Babylon, they didn't. So he promised her, I'll build you a mountain of greenery. And so sure enough, he built this terraced structure that ended up looking kind of like a mountain, but it was filled with lush and exotic vegetation. He had to come up with a very high-tech manner to pump water up to the top of this thing to keep all of this vegetation alive. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So reconstruction was a big deal in this Nebuchadnezzar's life. But so was expansion. And when I say expansion, I mean expanding the territory under his rule. Rather than the Assyrian Empire, he quickly built what became the Babylonian Empire, where Nebuchadnezzar led his army into the neighboring lands, conquering them. And one of the nations that he conquered was Judah. The the city, capital city of Judah was Jerusalem, where the temple was. And just the vicious nature of Nebuchadnezzar can be seen in that he burned the whole city of Jerusalem to the ground. He destroyed the holy temple of God, essentially bringing to an end the glorious nation of Judah that had been told to us in the Bible. It it, it ended with the vicious destruction of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was so vicious, believe it or not, he brought the last king of Judah out into the plains where he killed his two young sons before the king of Judah. He said, watch this, I'm going to have you see your sons killed. And then Nebuchadnezzar gouged out his eyes so that the last thing he ever saw was the 
execution of his sons. This Nebuchadnezzar is nasty. And yet the grace of God will be seen in our study because even as evil as he is, God's going after him. God's chasing after him. In doing so, God's showing that nobody is too evil to be sought after by God. In, in this example of God's pursuit of Nebuchadnezzar, he's, he's showing his grace in a, in a profound way, reminding us all that God loves sinners. And his grace and redemption is broad and wide enough to save even the worst of evil people. So he's besieging, you know, a siege is when they camp out around the city and prevent the people within from having water and food and in doing so they make them weak and ready to surrender. Well, he does, as I've mentioned, defeat the king of Judah. Let me read verse two, which says as much. It says, the Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar victory over the king of Judah. I don't think that's how Nebuchadnezzar would have described it. What do you mean the Lord gave victories? Like, I won, I defeated them. But yet we see that God was behind it. God, in his uh, desire to discipline his people, Judah, says, sorry guys, uh, the, the game's over. And God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to defeat. So God's in the works here. And what's fascinating is Nebuchadnezzar thinks that this defeat of Judah is all about him capturing those people. We're about to see it's about God capturing Nebuchadnezzar. Who's doing the capturing here? Friends, it's God. God, this is part of his chase after this man. Well, let me read verse 3. It says, Nebuchadnezzar ordered his chief official to bring back some of the Israelites, young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. This is fascinating. Nebuchadnezzar says, if my empire is going to be huge, I'm going to need leadership that is broad. I got to expand my leadership and make it extraordinary. And so part of his strategy was to look at conquered peoples and say, I'm going to take the cream of the crop, the, the smartest, the strongest, the best that a conquered nation has to offer. I'm going to take them when they're young and impressionable, and I'm going to raise them up to be leaders in my empire. The best way to lead a disgruntled conquered people is to use some of their own to lead them. That was his strategy. Look at verse 4. He was to teach them, these uh, selected men, he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. They were to go into a school, if you want, college, where they were brainwashed, where they were enculturated, where they came to see the world through a Babylonian worldview and have a Babylonian approach to life. Verse 5, they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they would enter the king's service. So they were teenagers, essentially going to college for three years in this case, before they were ready to serve the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 6 says, among those who were chosen were Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And then verse 7, the chief of staff renamed them with Babylonian names. So thorough was their enculturation as Babylonians that they were actually given Babylonian names. And you may recognize what those three friends of Daniel received as Babylonian names. So they were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, we're going to hear more about them, but that was their Babylonian names. So interesting. These four, Daniel and his three friends, were put into a pressure cooker of enculturation. Everything designed to make them thoroughly Babylonian. But watch this. Verse 8. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. There was one aspect of this enculturation that Daniel was fighting back on, where Daniel's like, yeah, 
can't go there. And it had to do with the royal food and the wine. And scholars have worked to try to figure out what was it about the the menu that was unacceptable to Daniel. Some have proposed it was probably because there was pork. You know, the Jews were told that you need to stay away from pork. And they probably served pork. Others have said it was probably not the select uh, of, of meat, but the preparation of the meat. The Bible, Old Testament says that you have to fully drain the meat of all blood before you cook it. And some have said they probably weren't preparing the Uh, the meat according to biblical instruction. It may be one of those two, but there's a third reason, and this is the one I think was on Daniel's mind. It was this. It was part of the ancient Babylonian tradition, specifically in the palace, to offer meat and wine to the pagan gods first and then serve it to the people in the palace. And in doing so, the the eating of that food and drink that had been devoted to the pagan deity, it became a form of worship. And so indirectly, Daniel and his friends would be participating in the worship of foreign gods by eating that food and drinking that wine. And Daniel's like, no, I, I can't do that. I worship God alone. Daniel's loyalty to to the Lord was his highest prerogative. You know, he was willing to participate in the culture of Babylon in a lot of ways. He was willing to learn their language and willing to study their literature, even willing to take the Babylonian names. But doing something that was worship to another God, like eating this dedicated food, Daniel's like, I draw the line there. I will not participate in the worship of other gods. I am loyal to and a worshiper of one God, the one true creator of heaven and earth. And so he said, no. Now, I want to point something out also in verse 8. It says this, Daniel asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And so not only did he resolve, I can't do this, he came to his boss, this chief official, And he said, hey, I got to ask you for permission. He wasn't a pain in the neck. He was respectful. And he said, would you help me not defile myself? It's so interesting that he explained that this food defiles me. He could have just said, I don't want your food. But he went on to explain why he didn't want the food. He said, there's a defilement in my life that would take place if I ate this. In other words, he helped this official understand his predicament. He said, listen, I, I, I worship the one, what I, who I believe to be the one true God. And you're aware that your meat and wine is dedicated to foreign gods. And so if I did that, it would be turning my back on the God I love. I love him so much that I can't do this to him. Would you figure out a way with me so that I can live with integrity and devotion to the God I love. This explanation must have been fascinating to this chief official. He's like, wow, dude, you take your religion seriously. He must have been impressed with the uniqueness of this Daniel as far as his desire to take a stand, even when it was weird or costly or dangerous to stand out in that hostile environment. Friends, this makes me think of uh, of a guy I met. I need to tell you the story. I was uh, I was invited to preach to the Chicago Bears. How about that, huh? And I went down to their chapel service, and I arrived early. I was n- nervous and. The first guy to arrive was this very average-sized individual. In fact, I thought he must be like on the staff or a coach. He's clearly not a football player. And he sat down, and uh, I didn't recognize him. You know, not being a uh, just a passionate Bears fan, I, I'm like, I know all the players. I don't know this guy. So I went over and I introduced myself. I said, I'm Jeff Griffin, the chapel speaker. He said, I'm Danny Warfel. And I'm like, yep. Don't know him. And I'm like, so Danny, are you uh, on staff here? And he's like, oh, I'm one of the players. And I'm, I fear my face gave it away. I'm like, you are? And he's like, don't worry. You probably 
don't recognize me. I'm like, what position do you play? And he said, I'm a quarterback. I'm like, I know the quarterbacks on the team. He's like, don't worry, I'm a, I'm a second stringer. I don't expect you to know me. He was the nicest guy. I was embarrassed to acknowledge that I didn't know him. But when I went home, I Googled Danny Warfel. Turns out he's a Heisman Trophy winner at the University of Florida. He was the first one to lead their school to a national championship. He's a big deal. And I insulted him with my admission that I didn't even know who he was. I, I started down a Danny Warfel uh, exploration and was so inspired by what I discovered. It turns out that as part of the benefits of winning the Heisman Trophy is that Playboy magazine announces you as the athlete of the year. You are given money, an all expense paid vacation to a tropical resort where you have a photo op with some of the girls and a pair in the magazine. Danny Warfel said, hey, thanks for that offer. I'm going to take a pass. And he became kind of the buzz in the media. How can this guy turn down such a great opportunity? In fact, one of the uh, beat writers for the Gainesville Sun, his name is Rob Andrew, he decided this Danny Warfel seems too squeaky clean to be true. He said, I'm going on an investigative journey to find dirt on Danny Warfel. He went to Coach Steve Spurrier, his friends, his teammates, and with everybody that he interviewed, just tell me something nasty about Danny. Couldn't find anything. He discovered, particularly from the coach, that Danny was remarkable, that he had no rage in a, in a sport where rage and hostility is the norm. Danny was known for controlling his temper and always being cool, calm, and collected. Danny had no vulgarity where, uh, you know, profanity was just the norm. Danny refused to ever say a questionable word. No boozing, no womanizing. He had no enemies because he was so loving to everyone that they all adored him. This coach, uh, Steve Spurrier, said this, he is the best queen living, hard driving quarterback I have ever met. This uh, Steve Spurrier, who was known for flying off the rails, just a hothead who would explode in fits of rage. He said, in the case of me coaching Danny, he said the, the impact direction was reversed. Normally it's supposed to be the coach who inspires the teammates. He's like, but the player, he inspired me. He said, to him, he said, Danny would explain to him, I'd ask him, why don't you get mad? And he said, hey, Jesus taught to turn the other cheek. If someone mistreats you, don't return evil for evil. And the coach was like, wow, this kid's amazing. And Coach Spurrier said, I gained patience by the example, the inspiring example of Danny Warfel. Isn't that interesting? What's going on there? Uh, this, this Daniel Warfel, like the Daniel in the Bible, is living a life devoted to the authority of God, even when it cuts in contrast to the ways of the culture. And as a result, both of these Dans, their lives have got, I'm going to use the word potency. There's something powerful about them. Because they stand out, because they march to the beat of a different drummer, their lives are just admirable. And so it was with this Daniel. Let's go back to the Daniel of the Bible and see what happens. Well, in verse 12, Daniel says this. Give us, that's me and my three friends, give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. As it turns out, the vegetables and the water were not devoted to the foreign gods in the way that the wine and the meat was. And so they're like, hey, we, vegetables are safe. Water is safe. In verse 10, the boss has this complaint. He says, I'm afraid of the king. That's Nebuchadnezzar. I'm afraid of the king who has assigned your food and drink. Nebuchadnezzar picked their diet. He goes on. He says, if, if the king sees you looking worse than the others, the king will have my head. <laughs> verse 12, Daniel says, well, then tell you what, please test us for 10 days. 
Daniel says, the Lord's going to sustain us. And even though we eat only vegetables and water, you see how we look. And so in verse 15, it says, at the end of 10 days, these four, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men who ate the royal food. When it says better nourished, the other uh, translations uh, translate that fatter. They look fatter than the others. And that's really what it's getting at. <laughs> That's a miracle, by the way. Can I just speak dietarily for a second here? You cannot get fatter on water and vegetables. Not that I've tried it, but I'm just certain that water and vegetables will not make you gain weight. And yet God intervened miraculously in this moment to honor those who honored him. God saw the courageous decision of these men to go against the cultural grain and God said, I'm proud of you, boys. And I will intervene to make sure that you are strong and healthy and don't look wasted away like just eating uh, vegetables and water could do. Let me read verse 18. At the end of the time, that's the end of the three years of these guys eating nothing but vegetables and water for three years. <laughs> At the end of the time set by the king, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. So here, this presentation is a big deal. For three years, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he chose them. He, he put them into this program. He picked their diet, their curriculum, but he hasn't really met them. Well, this is his chance to meet them. They are being officially presented by the chief official. Part of this presenting would be that the chief official would have told their story. He would have said, Nebuchadnezzar, I got to tell you about these four they are so committed to their God that they have refused to eat the meat and wine we served. And yet their God has preserved them. Look at them. They look fantastic. And Nebuchadnezzar would have been introduced to the potency of their unique commitment to the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar would have been fascinated by the story of the miracle God had done in sustaining them. But also, part of presenting them to Nebuchadnezzar meant, now Nebuchadnezzar will know them relationally. There is a, a connection here. I'm going to use the word proximity. Potency is the uniqueness of our lives. Proximity is when we come close relationally to people who are far from God. That's how God is chasing after this Nebuchadnezzar. He's bringing Daniel and his three friends into Nebuchadnezzar's life and with the potency of their example and now the proximity of their relational connectedness, Nebuchadnezzar is about to be impacted greatly. When I talk about the proximity, friends, I need, I need to point out, this is the, often a missing ingredient when it comes to impacting our world. There's a danger for Christians to lack proximity from people who are far from God. There's a p potential for Christians to get into their holy huddle, their circle of Christian friends, which is a beautiful thing, I might add. But if all we hang around are Christian friends, we are losing the impact in a world that needs Jesus. And so proximity, drawing near to a world, not, not being of them in the sense of embodying their worldview, but being among them. That's the proximity. In fact, we have a strategy in our church that is, is focused on relational proximity with people who are far from God. You may recall our pearl strategy. Jesus used an example that when people find Christ, it's like finding the pearl of great value. Well, we use the letters of pearl to lay out a relational evangelism strategy, a way to get proximity in place. It's really modeled by Jesus. Can I remind you of them? What are they? Well, P stands for pray. Find somebody who's far from God and start praying for their salvation. E stands for eat. Eat with them. One of the best ways to just build a friendship with someone far from God is to invite them over to your home for pizza, hang out, over meals, stories are told, and relationships develop. A. A is for ask questions. Friends, some people are preachers, and all they want to do is tell other people what they believe. Start by asking them about their story. Asking them about their beliefs, about how those beliefs 
came to be. Asking questions is a great way to honor others and deepen relationship. R, reveal your story. Eventually, after asking questions, they're going to say, tell me your story. And so you can tell them about your journey and how God has transformed your life. L, love them tangibly. Jesus said we are to be known by our love, and so we should find ways to love our friends in very meaningful ways. Through that five-point strategy, beautiful friendship can be built. And in the context of trusted relationship, folks will see Christ in us and understand that they need him too. God, in his chase after Nebuchadnezzar, has said, oh, I'm going to bring these four guys, Daniel and his three friends, into close proximity into Nebuchadnezzar's life. And he's about to have his life spiritually turned upside down by his four new friends. Let me just read you one more verse. It says in verse 19, King Nebuchadnezzar talked with them, and he found none equal to this Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is like, these guys are remarkable. There is a uniqueness and a beauty in their lives that caught the king's attention. I wanted to tell you that uh, this chase series that we're in, and we're looking at some chases. We saw the chase scene and uh, the Blues Brothers. Well, it turns out that the Blues Brothers chase scene is not viewed by Hollywood circles as the ultimate chase scene. That designation is reserved for a movie called Bullet. It was back in 1968, year I was born, 12 years before the Blues Brothers. And they say that the chase scene in Bullet is unprecedented. It changed the whole industry. Well, the star of Bullet is a guy by the name of Steve McQueen. And Steve was a rock star actor back in the 70s. He was just as famous as they come. And yet, though he had everything, he was miserable. Steve McQueen was trying to fill this void in his heart. He, he again, was famous. He was called the king of cool, the top actor in the 70s. Uh, he had wealth. He thought, I'll try to get rich. And sure enough, he was the highest paid actor back in that era. Uh, he had women, three wives, many mistresses. Women wouldn't satisfy that void. He dove into substances, became an alcohol addict, uh, marijuana, cocaine, LSD. These could not satisfy. He pursued thrill with abandon. In fact, he wanted to be the stunt driver in his own movies. No, no uh, stuntman was going to take his place. He loved race car driving. He raced motorcycles off-road. He pursued possessions. He had a collection, an unprecedented collection of antique cars, 100 to be exact, and 100 collector motorcycles. And yet despite all these things, he was empty. One thing he added to his collection, I believe at the prompting of God, as part of God's chase of this worldly guy, he added an airplane. Didn't know how to fly airplanes, but saw one for sale and couldn't pass it up. And so he bought this plane and then sought, this is later in his life in his 40s, he sought a pilot to teach him. You know, and he's Steve McQueen, he's got to have the best. And so I, he identified Sammy Mason, the famous stunt uh, pilot, and he said, that guy is going to teach me. And he pursued this Sammy. Sammy was old by this point and really retired. But because of the tenacity of Steve McQueen's pursuit, Sammy Mason said, all right, I'll teach you how to fly. If you know anything about flight training, you've got to log insane amount of hours with your instructor. And sure enough, they spent so much time together in the plane. Proximity. It turns out that this Sammy Mason was a Christian, a devoted follower of Jesus who was radically unique as to the secular culture. There's the potency 
of Sammy Mason. They spent all these hours together. Here's what Steve McQueen said. We spent countless hours flying and talking about the Lord. You say, how did the Lord come up? Well, I'll tell you. Steve McQueen looked at this old man and he said, this guy's got none of what I have and yet everything I want. Well, well, what did he want? He saw in the Sammy Mason a peace and a joy. He said Sammy Mason was just comfortable in his own skin. He had this humble confidence. He just had this love for life. And Steve McQueen pointed it out. He's like, dude, how did you get like you are? And Sammy said, Jesus. Jesus Christ has changed everything. Anything you see in me is because of him. And McQueen said, tell me more. And so for hours, they discussed the Bible, the gospel, and the life Jesus Christ has come to bring. This uh, Sammy Mason said, Steve, why don't you come to my church? It was this tiny little church called Ventura Missionary Church. Only 17 people attended the church, but they would start to go together. And after three months of Steve McQueen attending this little church every week, the pastor gave an invitation for people to pray to trust Christ. And Steve McQueen did. And he was never the same. Friends, doesn't this example show us that when God's in pursuit of even the most unlikely characters, he uses believers of potency and he uses proximity to bring about great change. God may be chasing you. God may be using you to chase another. Friends, let's continue to learn from Nebuchadnezzar in this new series so we can see the beautiful chase of God yield great fruit. Will you pray with me? God, I'm so excited about this series. So excited about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, about the beauty of their lives that stood out in a Babylonian context, about the proximity of you using these guys to befriend Nebuchadnezzar himself. Would you help us live that story? God, make us more like Jesus. Help us to live a life of intense potency that the world would say, what's up with you? Please make that true of us. And God, bring this proximity into play. Give us the courage to follow the pearl strategy and intentionally develop friendships filled with love with people far from you. Use us in these ways, God. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. You came to the world you created Trading your crown for a cross You willingly die Your innocent life paid the cost Counting your status as nothing The king of all kings came to serve Washing my feet Covering me
today. This week on Wednesday, we have a new podcast episode coming out that's going to dive deeper into the principles that we find in Daniel 1. We're going to talk about how we can use what's found in the Bible to honor God with our bodies and ensure that we will be on this earth to serve Him many, many years to come. If you're giving consistently to The Compass, we want to say thank you. Your gift enables us to reach people here, near, and far so that we can help them find and follow God. Join us next week for the continuation of our series, The Chase. See you then.